So I want to spend the next couple of minutes sharing with you how one of the largest natural disasters in the history of the Western Hemisphere and a haircut led to me becoming the tallest garbage man in all of the Caribbean. Huh? On January 12, 2010, I was playing dodgeball. In fact, I just won my first dodgeball match. We were celebrating at a bar near the Y in Pittsburgh, where I'm from. We were on our second, or maybe our third round, I can't remember, um, when Anderson Cooper came on the television to tell us that 300,000 people had just died in a massive earthquake in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. 300,000 people. The quake had apparently left 1.5 million people dead. I'm sorry, 1.5 million people homeless. I got home that night and I couldn't get it off my mind. And I remember thinking that night as I was drinking my beer, oh, what a shame. 300,000 people dead. 1.5 million people homeless. I got home that night and I couldn't get it out of my head. And I started to think, 300,000 people dead, that's about 3% of Haiti's population. A catastrophe of this size in the United States would have left every man, woman, and child in New York City dead, all five boroughs. And the combined population of 12 states, homeless. We simply haven't seen anything like this in a while. So, oh, what a shame. I woke up the next morning, I couldn't get it out of my head, and I, 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 just, I realized all of a sudden that, oh, what a shame is the best that you got. So six weeks later, I found myself on a plane to Port-au-Prince to do what it was that I did at the time, which was document. I've had the good fortune of traveling all over the world, first with MTV and then with my own production company, to film the way that people lived. I'd been to Africa and Europe and Central America. Uh, I got to Haiti, and it really wasn't about how people were living, but how they were surviving. Grief was apparent everywhere. This is a guy grieving over mass graves in Port-au-Prince. People prayed, and after a week in Port-au-Prince and almost 1,500 pictures, I realized that some things are the same in every language. <laughs> I, I realized, I, I knew immediately that I needed to return to Port-au-Prince. So in May, about six weeks after that, I enlisted the help of one of my best friends, Jesse Calaisi, he's a photographer in Pittsburgh and a much better photographer than I am. And, he and, I, and together, we made our way to Port-au-Prince. In fact, he'd never been outside of the United States before. Um, he underestimated Haiti's heat. And before we left, he, he had forgotten to get a haircut. So when we, got, when we arrived in Port-au-Prince, uh, our host, Pastor Ernesto Jean-Louis, took us to a barber shop in the hills above the city. It was clear that Jesse really needed a haircut, isn't it? <laughs> he took us to a barber shop in the hills above the city. And uh, Jesse sits down in the barber's chair. The barber looks at him and says, well, what do, you, what do you want? Jesse looks at him, and then he looks at the options available to him <laughs> on the wall. And he looks back up at the barber and he says, none of those. And it was at that moment that Tassi Filsame came, took me aside out into the street outside the barber shop, and he asked me to help save his life. See, I'd known Tassi, I'd met him before. In fact, he was a, uh, a singer in Pastor Jean Louis' church. Um, but I didn't know too much about him, so he began to tell me his story. Tassi's, Tassi's from a neighborhood in Port au Prince called Cite, Cite Soleil. It's one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city and certainly one of the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. Five brothers and sisters, 11 nieces, and one nephew. His name is Donnie. And Tassi and his family are among that 55% of Haitians that live in abject poverty less than $2 a day. When he was 13 years old, he discovered a lump in the lower left corner of his jaw, about the size of a pea. And over the course of three or four years, it grew until he was diagnosed several years later with a tumor that was slowly eating his face. What's ironic is that Tassi had survived the earthquake, but the doctors and the nurses and even the hospital that were to save him didn't. And here he was on the street outside of a barbershop in Port-au-Prince, asking me for help. Can you help me? Uka ede mwen, in Creole. Kind of rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Can you help me? And this is when I learned the first lesson, first of many lessons that I learned from Port-au-Prince. And that's when somebody asks you for help when you're back home in Pittsburgh, it can change your calendar. 
But when somebody asks you for help on the dusty streets and the hills above Port-au-Prince to save their life, it can change your life. The problem is, I had no idea how. So I went home and I Googled it. I tried to find out as much as I could about what Tassi had and tried to find a health system they could take on the surgery, which I learned over time was massive. Over the course of probably four months, uh, we finally, after looking everywhere, found a health system in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, right where I'm from, West Penn Allegheny Health System, that took on the task of helping us rebuild Tassi's face. They do it at cost, so we needed to raise over $100,000. And I'm happy to say that dozens of volunteers and friends and family came together in Pittsburgh to raise the $100,000 that we need to get Tassi here. After dozens of meetings, hours of negotiations with immigration, because Tassi didn't have a visa, on November of last year, we brought Tassi to the States for the surgery that would save his life. He spent, he spent four weeks in the hospital after a procedure they took his entire jaw out, right? They peeled his neck up, took his entire jaw out, and replaced it with a, le- a bone from his leg. Pretty crazy stuff, right? Then he spent the, su- the subsequent four months in the States, living with me and my roommate and my dog, Buster, <laughs> recovering. And it would have been a great four months, except Tassi was really melancholy all the time. <laughs> he was kind of a shy kid <laughs> and really withdrawn. Yeah, that's Toss. See, Toss came to the United States a stranger, but over the course of that four months, it was becoming clear, (laughs) it was becoming clear that he was family. And I got the chance in March of last year, it's like he's really here, in March of last year to take him home to his mama, happy and healthy. It was certainly one of the greatest days of all of our lives. Unfortunately, the home that we were taking Toss back to wasn't doing so hot. Right? At the time and now, 80% of Haiti's population lives under the poverty line. Over half live in abject poverty. That's less than $2 a day. It's difficult to find an education or get a decent job in Port-au-Prince. And at the time, cholera was on the rise. Thousands of people were dying. We've heard about all these things in the news, right? Over and above that, Haiti was being overrun with waste. It wasn't something new. Port-au-Prince, a city of 4 million, only has 15 working garbage trucks. So the question is, what to do about it next. And it was here that I learned the second lesson that I would learn from Port-au-Prince, and that's that we could save all the Tossies, all the faces of all the Tossies all over the world, and there are certainly millions of them. But we wouldn't save one life until we could create a home that our Tossies could go back to and get a job so that they can help themselves. A lot of, parts, a lot of smart people have said this, but if we only treat the symptoms of poverty without addressing its root cause, people will always be poor. I'll say it again because it's important. If we only treat the root cause of poverty, I'm sorry, if we only treat the symptoms of poverty without addressing its root cause, people will always be poor. It became clear that jobs were a thread that held a a number of solutions in the developing world together. With a good, decent job, you can have access to better nutrition. You have access to better housing, cleaner streets, access to immunizations that lower your rate of infectious disease, lower rates of malnutrition, clean water, access to a good school, and more, first and foremost and above all, dignity in a place that needs it more than anything else. But we weren't sure where to begin. We immediately felt insignificant. We'd help Toss. He's won. That took $100,000. There's millions of Tossies just in Port-au-Prince. Team Tossie was doing great. We'd since added five new kids to our roster, Jaline, Ruth, Nathaniel. Let's see, Jaline, Ruth, Nathaniel, Jamima. Who am I missing, Frank? And Wilkins, that's right. Uh, meanwhile, Ernso, uh, who trains entrepreneurs to create business in Haiti, sat me down at his kitchen counter in Port-au-Prince and asked me, can you help me? I need to create more jobs. Uka e Can you help me? Again, I really didn't have any idea where to begin, so I Googled it (laughs) again. (laughs) After some research and a lot of phone calls, we realized that 85% of the trash that's uh, on the ground in Port-au-Prince is recyclable. But unfortunately, nobody's exactly chomping at the bit to invest in Haiti. It's dirty and poor. 
Around that same time, I've written in my journal that if Haiti could figure out a way to turn trash into money equals good. Dirty and poor. Trash. Money. Dirty and poor. Trash. Money. After some more Googling, some, some field trips, a ton of trips back and forth to Port-au-Prince, we began to look at things a little differently and suddenly realized that we've been looking at Haiti through entirely the wrong lens. Instead of waste as a nuisance, we began to see a natural resource. And instead of unemployment, we began to see an underutilized labor force. Additionally, Haiti is only 710 miles from Miami and 710 miles in turn from the United States, one of the largest or the largest consumer economy on the planet. But the largest, we realized that the largest barrier to entry for business in Haiti isn't poverty and it isn't trash, it's fear. And if we could set aside that fear and find business opportunity where everybody else sees problems, that we can mine hope from even the poorest places on the planet. Real long-term economic change, we realize, depends solely on jobs. We have to help Haitians help themselves. This is where the idea for Thread was born. Thread takes trash from the streets of Port-au-Prince and turns it into raw materials with Haitian partners and then converts and improves those raw materials and eventually will create products that can be exported to places all over the world. So fabric, furniture, shoes, jackets, t-shirts. The great, the great thing about Thread is it's a for-profit company, but while we're doing it, we're cleaning up the streets of one of the dirtiest countries on the planet, as well as creating jobs that help save people's lives. We realized that we were onto something, so we started looking for property. Seven and a half acres in Port-au-Prince, courtesy of our old friend, Ernst Jean louis We decided to situate ourselves right on the edge of Cité Soleil, where Tassi's from, because that's where people needed us the most. We hired an architect, mass design, out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we charged them with helping us design the prreettiest space in Port au Prince. We realized that thread's not just a business, it's an example, right? An example that business doesn't need to be dirty and cramped, and jobs don't need to be unfair in order to be successful. Haitians deserve some dignity and some beauty just as much as we do. This is a, uh, a rendering of our, our Waste Innovation Center. We figured if we're picking up trash, um, we should be as green as possible, right? The seven and a half acre campus um, doesn't just include our Waste Innovation Center, though. Um, if we're gonna create jobs in Haiti, we might as well train people for jobs in Haiti as well. So we've added a uh, innovation center as well as a jobs training center. We even have a guest house. We created a guest house for our partners and our customers to come down Land, on, land at the airport on Port-au-Prince, drive through one of the poorest neighborhoods in the Western Hemisphere, arrive at our gates, and see that the developing world really is a place that can handle business. The goal is to turn neighborhoods like this and the neighborhoods that look like this. I'd gone to Haiti uh, two years earlier looking for answers, and I came back having found myself. And Tassi Filsome, had everything to do with that. From dozens of doctors and nurses remembering just why it was they got into medicine in the first place. Friends and family, hundreds of them, that realized just because a kid's skin is a different color and he speaks a different language doesn't mean that he's not family. That bills and appointments and grocery lists all pale a little bit in comparison when the kid sitting next to you at the dinner table knows what it's like to go without food for a week or so. That business doesn't need to be dirty and cramped, and labor doesn't need to be unfair in order for it to be successful. And then if we can begin to look at poverty and trash and problems as business opportunity, then we can mine hope from even the poorest places on the planet. I came home from that first trip to Port-au-Prince with a little more than a can you help me, uka et moi. And I realized that the kid who had asked me to help save his life had actually saved mine. The Haitians have this saying, Sik sac vide pas campé. An empty bag cannot stand. Sac vide pas campé. The Haitians need our help. The poor need our help. So let's fill their bags with trash and jobs 
and hope. Sakvid pa kampe, uka edemwe. Can you help me? Thank you.